Hey there. Hi, I'm Marcus. How's it going? We can do better than that. Hi. There we go. There we go. Um, I got to tell you, I am so excited to be with you all today. So thank you for carving out the space for letting me uh, be with you. But let's jump right into this thing. I want to talk to you today about perspective. Because I'm a firm believer, as Nias Nam puts it, that things aren't the way they are. They are the way that we are. That is the way that we see the world govern how the world shows up in our brains and how we ultimately move. But that sounds very highfalutin and abstract, so let's make this much more tangible. I have two daughters named Georgia and Ivy, and when Georgia was an infant, I took her to the pool and did one of these numbers. Check it out. So here's uh, me and Georgia at the pool, throw in the air, get a little air time, not bad. And I catch her, boom, that's me, perfect father, that's me. I'm proud of myself, thank you. There's a, lar- there's a low bar, I know, but I'm proud of myself. Now here's how I saw that situation. I threw Georgia in the air just a little bit, nothing to be worried about. Georgia may have seen me throw the air a little bit higher. My wife? My (laughs) gosh! You're gonna kill our child, right? It's all a matter of perspective. Things aren't the way they are, they are the way that we are. And if we change the way we see the world, then the world will change. So let me provide a perspective for you with regards to brand, particularly with regards to the future of brand. Now, I had a great introduction, but you notice the introduction, nothing would say about me being a futurist because ugh. But more importantly, I'm not clairvoyant that way. But I do want to provide a perspective for the future because we are stewards of brands in this room. And if we already get an understanding of the future, then we must grasp a good understanding of the past. So if you will with me, let's jump into our figurative DeLorean and let's go back in the past to, to, to observe how brands have evolved to where they are today, so we might have an understanding of where they're going tomorrow. Now here's a fun fact for you. The first brand to ever be trademark was in the 1700s. A guy by the name of Josiah Wedgwood made pottery, and he'd bring his pottery to market. And to ensure that his pottery wasn't mistaken for somebody else's pottery, he put his name on it. As a way of signaling this belonged to him. Or more importantly, this brand became a mark of ownership. And if we look at the etymology of brand, in any, any romantic or dramatic language, brand translates to mark, a marque, a marca. And in this way, brand acted as a legal mark, a way by which Josiah Wedgwood would say that this belongs to me legally and cannot be copied. In those days, if you were into brand, that's what you did. You slapped the logo on it and you were a brand marketer. That's what you did. But you fast forward two and a half centuries later and things start to change. Markers got really smart. We started using psychology to better understand consumers. We refer to this as the madman era. And in these days, we were using psychology to better understand consumer behavior, consumer motivations. And from this, we started to create value propositions. My razor sharper, my battery lasts longer, my car goes faster, my shampoo will get you laid or whatever, right? And then we started using positioning statements. This was the the cognitive real estate that we're going to own in people's mind when they thought about a job to be done, they will think about our products. We even use these associative methods. Start thinking about Santa Claus, red and white, think about Coca-Cola. And the idea was that was breeding familiarity. And the more familiar we were with these brands, the more likely we were to trust it. And in this way, brands evolved into being a trust mark, moving beyond legality to being something that we trusted. You know that saying, no one's ever got fired for hiring IBM? The idea is that you can trust IBM. At least that's how the saying goes. But you fast forward three decades later, we find ourselves in the 1980s, and marketers go, no, it's not enough for people to want to buy our brands. We want people to love us. So marketers move from this idea of making statements about value propositions to, 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 to developing relationships not statements, but stories, beyond transactions to relationships. Move from being recognized to being loved. And in those days, this is what we focused on. Transactions to relationships, statements to stories, recognized to being loved. And all the marketing communications in those days, there were these robust, massive stories where the brand was basically a character in said story. And the idea, was that these stories will evoke emotion within us and we find ourselves being connected to these vessels of meaning. 
And brands will serve, as Sachi Sachi put it, as a love mark, transcending legality, moving beyond trust to being love, where when you see the brand, you feel all the feels. And we know this empirically, that when brands activate at an emotional level, beyond a rational level, they work harder and longer in the long run, empirically, which leads us to where we are today. The most powerful brands leverage culture as a way to connect with people. Why is that? Because of who we are, our identity, we see the world a certain way. And because we see the world a certain way, we show up in the world a certain way. We behave a certain way. Artifacts that we don, the behaviors that are normative, the language that we use, and we express our cultural subscription through literature, art, film, movies, music, and brands and branded products. And this is important for marketers because culture influences a consumer's social need such that people consume as a way to signal who they are, as a way to make their culture material. And the brands and branded products that we use, they're really identity projects that we show the world who we are to find people who are just like us. These things are rooted in our identity, not because of what the products are, but because of who we are. Because of who I am, I use these brands to signal to the world my identity. But that sounds abstract, so let's make this a little bit more tangible. I'm gonna take you back to 2008. All right, this is the recession, it was a bad time in the country. What would say even the globe? Bad, bad times. But it did give us one gift, one gift the recession gave us, the urban hipster. How lucky are we? These guys were, they, were, they wore man buns, ero uh, uh, ironic facial hair, lots of plaid suspenders. They didn't uh, drive cars, they rode bikes. And they held this belief, much like their predecessors, the hipsters, and the hippies, and much like their predecessors, the beatniks, they had this idea of egalitarianism, about freedom of expression, about individuality. And everything about corporate America was antithetical to that. And what were these folks, alcoholic beverage of choice? But specifically, what brand? PBR. <laughs> Clearly, y'all know them about hipsters. PBR! And why PBR? Because the brand actually saw the world the way hipsters did. They believed in egalitarianism. They believed in freedom of expression. They believed in individuality. And if you were a hipster, you definitely had your PBR on tap. As a way of communicating your identity. And as a result, PBR's business exploded almost single-handedly thanks to the hipsters. It became a billion dollar business because of this group of people. And if you look at the category, the category was flat or declining. While PBR's business was hockey stick growth. This is Superman powerful stuff here. And the brands who are able to leverage the power of culture, they win because they realize what Irving Ross refers to as identity congruence theory, that people purchase a brand or product only when they're consistent with, enhances, or in some way fit well into the conception that they have of themselves. That we consume as a way of making our culture and our identity material. I would argue even that culture by its nature, that consumption by its nature is a cultural act. What we wear, what we buy, what we drive, where we go, how we adorn ourselves, how we style our hair, if you have it, well, where you go to school, if you go to school, who you marry, if you marry, where you vacation, where you eat, where you bury the dead, if you bury the dead, all of these things are byproducts of our cultural subscription. And we choose the brands that are aligned with who we are. Some of the most powerful brands have nothing to do with the value propositions, but everything to do with our identity. And our identity is subscribed to our culture. We know this intuitively because we say things like the brand stands for something. What we really mean to say is the brand stands in for something. The brand stands in for how I want to be perceived. The brand stands in as an expression of my identity. Whether it's the artifacts that I wear, right? you take a Patagonia jacket, take the logo off and put a 
North Face jacket next to it with the logo off of it, they look exactly the same. But as soon as you put that logo on it, it means something different and therefore we're more inclined to consume and pay a premium for it. And in this way, today's brands, the most powerful brands, serve as an identity mark, as a way of seeing to the world who we are. Transcending legality, moving beyond trust, moving beyond being loved, to being a way by which we communicate who we are. Now, if you follow that logic, if you follow that, then what does that tell us about the future, tomorrow? Now look, I'm not clairvoyant, I'm not that smart, but I don't think you need to be able to tell the future, to see the future in this regard, because it's written on the walls. If we use brands today, the most powerful brands, to signal our identity today, to communicate to the world who we are, like peacocks showing who we are, then the most powerful brands tomorrow will be communal in nature. Because of who we are, we go find people who are like ourselves. Why? Because we're wired to do that. Aristotle said it best, that man by nature is a social animal. We do everything he can to crash into each other. Evolutionary anthropologists would argue that the reason why we were able to evolve as a species was because of our ability to cooperate, to socialize. It's wired within us to connect with our friends, our families, our teammates, fraternity brothers, sorority sisters, congregates, our people. And if we use brands to signal who we are, then we are by nature inclined to go find people like us. I like the way Dr. Levine puts it. He says, we humans are social species, tribal by nature. We're given to gathering and communing with familiar groups, belonging, that is, our capacity and need for empathy, compassion, communication is deep in our DNA. This is just who we are. And because of who we are, we find people like ourselves. Whether it's our familial groups, our social groups, and even our consumption groups. If you happen to be really into Harley Davidson, you're probably a hog, Harley Davidson owner group. And you go find other hogs like yourself. If you're really into Star Trek, you probably consider yourself a Trekkie. And you go find other Trekkies. Or maybe you go to Burning Man, you consider yourself a burner. And what happens when you find someone who sees the world the way you do? You go, you love Frank Ocean, I love Frank Ocean. Best friends. Emil Durkheim, one of the founding fathers of sociology, describes this as collective effervescence, and I love that phrase, so beautiful, collective effervescence. And it's when people who subscribe to the same culture, they act in concert as a way to promote social solidarity among themselves. We move because people like us move. And culture moves forward on the basis of one simple question. Do people like me do something like this? The answer is yes, we do it. The answer is no, we don't. We make that decision hundreds, if not thousands of times a day whether we're aware of it or not. And the future of brand will be tribal in nature. It will be communal in nature, transcending legality, moving beyond trust, moving beyond love, taking one step beyond identity to be about community. But that sounds really highfalutin and abstract, so let's make this very tangible. Do you guys know McDonald's? Do you know McDonald's, question mark? I say, that's just rude, guys. I asked a question. Do you know McDonald's? Yeah. There you go. Oh, okay, okay, take it easy, take it easy, take it easy. So uh, I used to run strategy at Wyden Kennedy, uh, the chief strategy officer there, and one of our beloved clients is McDonald's. McDonald's came to us a few years ago and said, hey, guys, listen, we're struggling right now. Year over year decline in revenue, but year over year increase in hate. <laughs> Like people hate at McDonald's. You could thank Martin Spurlock and Super Size Me. You could thank the obesity epidemic that we're facing as a country. And McDonald's became the punching bag for everything wrong with the American diet. Hate, 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 hate. For 15 years, McDonald's was trying to battle the hate and they were losing terribly. And they came to us and said, hey, help us battle the hate. We said, well, yeah, a lot of people do hate you. That's true but 96 million people show up at your door every single day. That's a lot of love. Why don't you focus on them? You're like, that's a good question. We never thought about it that way. But who are those people? We didn't know. 
Who are these people that, despite the vitriol associated with the brand, they'll show up every single day to buy McDonald's and subscribe their identity to who they are? We didn't know. So we jumped in the car and did an ethnography, like every good marketer would. Went from Chicago down through the heartland of the country, talking to real life human beings from different walks of life, different demographies, age, race, gender, nationality, religion, like all these different makeups of people that all had in common that they were fans of McDonald's. After talking to these people from this great heterogeneity, heterogeneous pool of people, we found what we call fan truths. These are truths that were true in all of these people we talked to, writ large, even though they didn't know each other. And you may know a few of these. Uh, for one, uh, your friend would take a fry even after they say they don't want a fry. That's a friend, that's my wife all day long. Fan truth. Uh, oh, is there anyone out there who doesn't eat the, uh, the cheese off the wrapper? If you don't, you're a monster. That cheese is phenomenal. <laughs> Fan truth, right? This one is uh, very much me. Uh, you order water but steal some soda? That's me. Fan truth. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Uh, or my, my younger years, uh, those late nights in college, we had too much to drink. And the only thing open is McDonald's. Those, those arches become like lights of salvation. Fan truths. But there was one fan truth more powerful than all of them. And it was this. No matter how famous, how big you were, everyone has an order. It was sort of a democratizer. No matter how famous you are, everyone has an order. And we thought that was just so powerful, considering the scale of McDonald's and the intimacy it was able to have as well. It's such a rare thing to find. So it's with that truth that we decided to put this in the world in an effort to activate fans. Check it out. Bum, bum. So we put this in the world, and we start to see a lot of the discourse happen among fans. People are like, my order is this, and no way Kim Kardashian eats chicken nuggets, and well, how do I in the world would anyone eat a fish fillet? Like all these conversations, but none of the hate. There were just demonstrations of fandom. We said, we're on to something here. How might we make it real? From just stoking fandom, how do we make it material? So we had the idea that what if we took a famous person's famous order and made available for people to buy themselves. Someone that had long receipts of being a fan that we could tap into as a fan to make this idea real. So we partnered with a gentleman named Travis Scott uh, who had long been a fan of McDonald's. Actually, we saw a video from him back in 2016 when he's in his Bugatti eating McDonald's. It's like, wow, that's the guy right there. We're gonna do that. And we took his order, which is a quarter pounder with bacon, cheese, uh, barbecue sauce for the fries with a Sprite, and offered it up to the country as a way to celebrate their fandom as well. Check it out. What's up, world? Yeah, you. I'm Travis Scott. This is my McDonald's order. Follow me. Here's my quarter pounder with lettuce, pickles, onions, ketchup, mustard, and bacon. Here's my fries. Sometimes I do this. Then I dip them into barbecue sauce. Oh yeah, and my Sprite. Same order since back in Houston, and you can try too. Gotta go. The Travis Scott meal, just six dollars. Say Cactus Jack sent you. So we launched the campaign that only lasted for a month. But the important part to know is that this wasn't a new product. In fact, the Travis Scott could have been the Marcus Collins. It's not, but it could have been. Right? Not a new product, but a new frame, a cultural frame that tapped into the nuances of this community. And when we launched this campaign in the first week and a half, we broke the supply chain of quarter pounder ingredients from McDonald's. I mean, this thing has gotten so active that people were actually stealing the posters off the wall when the restaurants were closed and selling them on eBay. In the one month that this campaign lived, we increased revenue by $50 million and Wall Street added $10 billion 
to McDonald's market cap. Not a new product, new framing through a cultural lens. So we knew we were onto something. So we partnered with, with Jay Balvin. This is the Prince of Reggaeton, whose famous order is a Big Mac uh, with the Oreo McFlurry when the machine's not broken, because it's always broken. Um, then we partnered with BTS. Their famous order is a 10-piece nugget that they all share because they're super skinny. I'm kidding. <laughs> they are really skinny, though. Um, and then we partnered with, with Sweetie, who has a, a penchant for some weird concoctions when it comes to the food that she makes. Like, she has a prison palette in a lot of ways. Uh, so we took her, her, we took her famous order and made it available. And then we partnered with Mariah Carey. And here's people go, wait a minute, dog. Mariah Carey does not eat McDonald's. Well, she does. She's a fan. We got the proof of it. Right? Again, what makes this so powerful is that it's true of who these people are. Most recently, we did a campaign with, with Cardi B in, in Offset for, for, for Valentine's Day. And this has completely changed McDonald's business. In fact, McDonald's has only released two new products in the last four years that we've worked with them. The chicken sandwich and the mobile app. But their business has changed dramatically because they see the world as a brand through a cultural lens, activating a community of people, not consumers, machines who eat messages and crap cash, but real life human beings. They talk to fans like a fan and activate them accordingly. And interestingly, the category began to copy, right? Like the QSR, did, QSR category made their own version of quote unquote celebrity meals. Uh, Burger King did theirs, they called it the real meal because they do it real, I suppose. Uh, and instead of having the stage name of these famous people, they used their regular name, like Cornell Haynes Jr. Uh, that's Nelly, lame. Yep, so here's the thing. <laughs> the execution was whack. But more importantly, it's lame because it wasn't true of their people. They copied the executions without having the intimacy of their people. It wasn't true for Burger King fans, but it was for McDonald's. And having an understanding of the cultural characteristics, the social facts that govern these groups of people has helped McDonald's turn their entire business around. What was once hated is now considered cool according to the Wall Street Journal. I don't know if they have license to say that, but we'll take it, right? This is Superman powerful stuff here. But not only is it culturally in the zeitgeist in a positive way, but it's impacting their business in a massive way. Being awarded the Epi's Award for most effective marketer last year, and even Wark is awarded McDonald's being the most, brand, uh, the most awarded brand effectiveness. This, this campaign is often thought about as a as a celebrity meal, but we think that that's wrong. It's not a celebrity meal, it's a community meal. That is, we tapped into the social facts of a group of people who are both McDonald's fans and fans of Travis Scott and found where they intersected them and activated them in a very intimate way. And not only did it uh, get people to consume, which was great, but more importantly, people started using the brand as a way to communicate their identity. They started to rework all the artifacts that came along with the campaign to find people who were just like themselves. And that's where the opportunity exists for brands, where the brand belief and the community beliefs overlap. It's the intersection of those two things that we're able to activate people to get people to move. We create meaningful relationships, not with consumers, but with fans. Meaningful relationships with meaningful people. This is, after all, how ideas spread. Everything we know about how ideas spread is manifested in this core idea. So I'm going to take you back to, to your statistics course from back in the day. I'm a professor, so I can't help myself. Right? So this is the Gaussian curve. It is, the, it, is the, it is recognized as the most accurate description of how things propagate in a population. You know this more colloquially as the normal curve, where the mean, the mode, the median are equal. It's a measurement of centrality. And we call it the normal curve because everything that happens organically abides by this distribution. And of course, the more in the middle you are, the more normal you are. And there's social forces telling you to be normal, to dress this way, to act this way, to talk this way, to work at these kind of companies. That is culture, a measurement of normality. 
the more that you abide by the cultural characteristics of the populace, the more normal you are. And we know this as marketers because we create an instrument to talk to those normal people. The sales funnel where we blast as many people as possible with messages, prayerfully we'll reach 20% of them, and hopefully, God willing, inshallah, we can convert a 0.012% of them. And when that happens, we go high five the media agency. We killed it, guys. Ridiculous. While that may be efficient, it certainly is not effective. Not to mention, it's super noisy in the middle. So it's very expensive to be inefficient or to be not effective. But what's happening on the side there, the fringe, we call that subculture. And everything we know about what's normal today started off as a subculture. Everything that is now cool, that is now normal, started off fringe, started off weird. And then it began to populate, to propagate inside the populace. For instance, 20 years ago, if you were into comic books, you were a loser. Now, the movies that we watch across the globe all come from comic books. What was once fringe is now normal. Right? Even Bad Bunny is about to be a, a, a comic book a, a, a character. Right? 30 years, 20 years ago, if you were into collectibles, this was you. Whack. Now, collectibles are cool. 20 years ago, if you were into gaming, this was you. Failure to launch living in your mama's basement. Now, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. Gaming is cool. 20 years ago, or maybe five years ago, <laughs> five years ago, if you were into anime, this was you. Now anime is cool. 10 years ago, if you paid $5,000 for a pair of sneakers, people would say, you out your mind. Now marketers leverage sneaker culture to release new products. We call them drops. This is the future of brand, not Legality, not value propositions, not being loved, moving beyond identity to helping facilitate communities. And the brands of the future, those will be the ones that win. And the ones who are still trying to make the logo bigger, the ones who are still talking about my razor sharper, my battery lasts longer, my car goes faster, those will be the losers. This completely changes the paradigm of how we think of traditional marketing communications. Because typically we have brands that have products, and we communicate our products through some marketing communications, value proposition driven to reach a group of people. And maybe we'll get their attention. We call it advertising, which means to avert, to get people's attention. But if we look at where we're going, the future of brand, the most powerful brands are the ones that see the world a certain way, tap into a network of people who see the world similarly, and those people consume, not because of what you are, but because of who they are. And they use the brand as a way to communicate their identity. And then they shared with people who are just like them. And then they shared with people who are just like them. And they shared with people who are just like them. And so on, and so on, and so on. Christakis and Fowler says it this way, that when a small group of people begin acting in concert, displaying similar visible symptoms, the epidemic is spread across social network ties, the emotional contagion, and large groups become quickly emotionally synchronized. And they act in concert as an act of social solidarity. This completely changes the paradigm of how we target. No more blast as many people as possible, maybe reach a few, maybe, maybe convert a few of those. Instead, let's find the most demonstrative representation of the community who sees the world the way we do and activate them. And they will go activate other people on our behalf. This paradigm is exactly this. It is the nature of how all things spread, whether we know it or not. Now, of course, this isn't meant to be mutually exclusive, right? We do fireworks and campfires. We do things to get people's attention while fortifying community. And what we know empirically is that the most strongest brands, they benefit from that, from brand building and the short term. Two philosophers uh, by the name of Professor uh, base and rock said it takes two to make a thing go right. Two to make a thing go right. But what this focuses on, what this requires of us is to focus on people, not consumers, not demographics, not boxes that we put people in, but real life human beings that are given to be communal in nature. 
and the brands that can facilitate these networks, those will be the ones who will win in the future. And those who cannot, sorry for you. Example, I used to run digital strategy for this artist named Beyonce. I don't know if you guys ever heard of her before. She's seen a few songs. And so my job, among many things, was about taking her offline fan club and putting it online. And this is like in the Sa I Am Sasha Fierce days. So I go, pfft, easy peasy. I use Facebook, Twitter, got it, donezo. Super easy. And we set up this massive space, this massive, remember Facebook fan pages? This massive, massive real estate for her. That's gonna, we're gonna reveal it and everybody's gonna come over because this is Beyonce after all. And we had a really cool name for it too. Uh, we called it the Beyonce. Terrible name, I know. But, but to, to our credit, Entourage was a big show at the time. So, all right, it was bad. So we launched this thing and it's like a complete failure relative to her stardom. It's a party that no one shows up to. I'm like, what's going on here? Why isn't this working? So we started to look in the recesses on the internet and we found this group of people who called themselves the Beehive. And these groups of people, they weren't just fans of Beyonce. They didn't just like her music. They saw the world the way Beyonce does. Beyonce, since we've known her in her Destiny's Child days, has stood for women's empowerment. Since, no, 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 can you pay my bills, to the left, uh, survivor to you ain't gonna break my soul. Everything about Beyonce has been all about women's empowerment. And these groups of people saw the world similarly. And these groups of people were massively engaged in their community. I mean, they had their own language for Pete's sakes, their own artifacts, their own behaviors. So we said to ourselves, let's cut bait on this Beyonce thing, again, terrible name, and let's make them the official fan club. That's exactly what we did. We didn't start the beehive, they did. And we activated them through the resources that we had. And this is a powerful thing, because while Beyonce is an amazing, amazing artist, for sure, it's her ideology and her ability to connect with other people who see the world similarly that makes her so massive. There's actually a church service called Beyonce Mass. She's not the deity but they worship through the lens of women's empowerment using Beyonce's music because it's the perfect cultural product to do that very thing. And you can look at that and say that's super hyperbolic, but neuroscientists are showing us that the part of the brain that's activated when we engage with our, the brands that we feel most closest to, it's the same part of the brain that's activated when we engage in religious experiences. That's Superman powerful stuff here. This is not about products, this is about people. And these brands become consecrated. They move beyond the category. They move beyond the products to being this way by which we connect with the world and people around us. You know, and why didn't we build our agency through Nike? And anybody who works on Nike knows two things. One, that Phil Knight hates advertising, because he does. But more importantly, that when you're at Wyden working on Nike, you're not making advertising. You're evangelizing the faith. You're preaching the gospel of what the brand believes, that every human body is an athlete. And we talk to athletes through that lens, realizing that every human body is an athlete. The only thing keeping you from being your best athletic self is you. So what does Nike tell you? Just do it. It's where the brand beliefs and the network beliefs overlap. The ideologies of the brand become extensions of the ideologies of the people, and people use the brand to communicate who they are. This isn't about the products that we create. The products we create are just demonstrative representations of our beliefs. They're about people and their people. And the beautiful part about it is that the technologies that we're using more and more today are helping us facilitate this very thing. Web 3.0 is about decentralizing networks and finding more people like yourself. I mean, I love the way they describe it. These Web 3.0 guys say that community is marketing and marketing is community. We go to market through people. So for us, as stewards of these amazing brands that you work on every single day, we gotta ask ourselves, what does the brand believe? How does the brand see the world? Not what it does, but its ideology. And then we find the tribe of people who see the world similarly. And as we identify who they are, 
That is, we find the beehive among people who listen to Beyonce. We find the Swifties among people who listen to Taylor Swift. We find the liberals among people who vote Democrat. We find the Trekkies among people who watch Star Trek. We find the believers among the consumers. And we activate them. And those people go preach the gospel on our behalf. Not because of who we are, but because of who they are. We preach the gospel to them, and they preach the gospel to their friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, many of you work in CRM, you work in email, and you go, fam, this don't sound like you're talking to me. I am. What's more intimate than my email? People have to be invited to my email. And if you don't, pff, delete. And in this space, I hear from Seth Godin every single day, 365 days, uh, uh, days a year. I don't know him, but I feel like I do. And as in my email every week, I don't know her, but I feel like I do. This is not about the technology, just as much as it's not about the products. It's about the people. W.E.D. DuBose puts it this way, herein lies the tragedy age. Not that men are poor, because we all know something about poverty. Not that men are wicked, because what is good. Not that men are liars, because what is truth. And nay, we know so little about mankind. And the more we understand people, the more likely we are to activate them to move. So here's some takeaways. We need to move from focusing on audiences to focusing on communities. Less about people waiting for messages to wave over them, but more about active people, who we are, human beings. Secondly, move from value propositions to ideological congruence. What do we believe, what do they believe, and how do these things come together? Move from making ads that get people's attention to creating cultural production. These are the communicative objects that people use to express their identity. And when they do so, you benefit from it. This moves from being the brand at the center to community at the center. How can we facilitate these connections between them that are so very powerful that influences every single thing that they do? Moving from focusing on popular culture, that is our big sales funnel, to activating subcultures. Because those subcultures, they reverberate to become popular. Everything popular now started with those folks. And that requires us taking off our selling hat to being in our empathic hat. How do we help people? How do we help remove the points of friction that keep people from doing the things that they so want to do? But the only way that happens is to see them as humans, not as machines that eat messages and crap cash, not as consumers, but real life human beings. I hope this is helpful at the very least, the very, very least. I hope this forces you to see the world differently because the way you see the world informs the way that you behave in the world. And if you like what you heard, there's so much more in the book that you actually own. It's yours now. And I'd love to hear what you think. Thank you so very much.